all these questions about the ESP, nobody really knows the answer to. But I'm happy to... So, you see, since we don't know how psychic abilities work, we then don't really know what makes them work well or what makes them not work well. But I'll share with you my experience in trying to do this. Yeah, and you know what? One of the things I've found that you don't find in the write-ups of of different parapsychology studies, you you read obviously the results, the quantitative results, the statistics, the methods, but you don't you don't read about what was going on in the person's head. What was the processes? So, for example, when you I know you sometimes will even do a remote viewing session or we could refer back to whether we want to we could ask you, you know, when if someone gives you a target, what processes are you going through in your mind to get a result? Or let's say Hella Hammond, you know, when she first came in to, to SRI, uh, she didn't have any experience. And one thing I've always wondered, it's not like she walked in and you stuck her in a room by okay. herself and didn't give her any instructions at all, right? So what did you do to to walk her through the process? If you could well, talk about uh, that a little bit. Hella was an experienced meditator. She had never done any psychic stuff before. Uh, she was a professional photographer, uh, very well thought of, was born in Germany, lived in France, came to America. So she was fluent in several languages. Did you know Hella? I didn't know her personally, but I've watched videos of you and her together um, in a session. So she is a very charming, uh, intelligent woman. You could take her anywhere. Uh, she'd never embarrass you. There's nothing weird about her. She comes across as a... Uh, charming sort of European edge professional woman, like a movie star. So she yeah. was very easy very easy to work with. What happened is we worked with Pat Price and Ingo Swan and they of course did excellently in tasks that we did. And then the CIA said, Can't you bring us an ordinary person to the control? who had never done this before, and Hella was a friend of the family, a friend of my wife and me, and I said she had just come to California, and I thought it would be fun, it would be amusing to work with her doing this, since I had already done work with numerous people who had never done it before, and Hella thought it would be fun to work with me, because we got along very well. So, so, her introduction to the program was actually nothing. That she had well, never done remote viewing, but she was a she was an enthusiastic meditator. Well, and so can you walk us through like the very first time you had her do a target? Like yes. you remember what you did with her? Yes, we went to our upstairs workroom, which was a really a, a sitting room with a a easy chair and a couch. <clears throat> she lay down on the couch, and I said, "It's three o'clock now. Hell is at some kind of distant location." Well, you probably heard this film because I have the original film, which appears in my movie. I have the original audio. So yeah. I said to Hella, Hella, I said to Hella, you you you've probably seen my film, right? Yeah. Was, so in that you have me uh, walking her through this. I say Hella is now at his hiding place. Uh, could you take a couple of deep breaths, uh, quiet your mind, and tell me about the surprising images that come into your awareness? That is to say, I would never say, where is hell hiding? Because it's an analytical question and psychic abilities are a non-analytical function. So I never ask uh, any questions. Other than, The only kind of question that I will ever ask a person is, what are you experiencing? 
Uh, I understand what you've just said. What do you experience that makes you say that? They're the only thing that I would ever say. I can say that in different ways. But I would start her out saying, Hal, that is location. Uh, I have no idea where he is, of course. Can you tell me what you see that's interesting? What kind of surprising images show up in your awareness? And that's basically the magic words uh, that I use throughout the program uh, to get people started. They're looking for, the goal is, to have them look internally for a surprising image rather than trying to guess where they're at. Because well, the, I, so I want you to go ahead. What what you're saying there I think is extremely important. That word surprising image, why do you use that word as opposed to other words? Because we're trying to get away from what Ingo calls analytical overlay which has been understood for 800 years, the idea of name. Padmasambhava, the great Buddhist teacher who brought psychic, who brought Buddhism from India to Tibet, and he wrote about, uh, he wrote a book called Self-Liberation Through Seeing with Naked Awareness. This is in... Uh, Year 800, self-liberation through seeing with naked awareness it is our nature. That's really who we who we are is a being with naked awareness. It's our nature. And in order to experience that, you have to get away from uh, naming and grasping is what he knew in the year 800. Wow. So the, so the idea... Of, of naming and grasping as a source of noise is is not a new discovery. Uh, War Collier knew about this in the 1940s. Uh, Ingo wrote about it specifically and called it analytical overlay. Anything that's analytical brings noise into the system. So the process that makes ESP work, we don't know how to increase the signal. Nobody knows that. But we've gotten very skillful at how to diminish the noise. For example, you do remote viewing in a quiet place. Uh, You do it in a place where uh, the lights are dim and there's no weird paintings on the wall. So you want to get rid of um, audio noise and visual noise. But now here... Let me stop you there. Sorry to interrupt. Now, you're saying you don't know much about what what increases it, but you, again, getting back to the word surprising, it's not like you were, used that word a couple of times, so you, you weren't saying interesting or tell, tell us just, you know, what you see, but now, something... Interesting is an analytical ta- is an analytical idea. I'm not trying to interest you. I'm trying to surprise you. Wow. You know, in all these years that I've been studying remote viewing, I've never heard anyone suggest using that word, what surprises you. So, see, this is already extremely helpful. It's all about signal to noise. I have them sitting down quietly. I'm chatting with them. And then I my last instruction, thing that I always, always use for uh, this kind of thing, is I try. I often deal with army people who've never done this. Don't believe in it. I say you can't do this wrong, because all I'm asking you to do is look at your own internal process and just tell me what you're experiencing. There's, there's nothing, no mumbo jumbo here. With, with uh, Hal's hiding someplace, uh, you're connected to him. There's no separation between you and Hal in consciousness, and I just want you to tell me what comes into your awareness that might pertain to where he is. What what new, what's surprising? He's going to be in a visually interesting place. He's not going to be hiding in a black box. 
<laughs> so and and so and what? Like what what would you do then if someone said, "Well, I'm just not seeing anything." Like you must have had, sometimes had that happen, right? Or yeah, if they, I'm just. If they, I, I once went with a uh, a visiting scientist who was part of a oversight panel. Uh, I can't remember his name, and a very famous Israeli physicist whose name I just can't remember right now. And no Hale and another guy went to hide someplace. And I'm sitting with uh, this this man, this, this Israeli guy, sort of maybe 40-year-old, is well-known. If I would stop talking, I could remember his name, but it doesn't matter who he is. <laughs> right. And he, he said... When I cl- I don't know about you, Russ. When I close my eyes, it's dark. I'm just not getting anything. And I said, "Well, the time is almost up. They've been at their place for a half hour. Why don't you just close your eyes and make up something? Pretend that you see something, and tell me what are you making up? What sort of thing comes to your mind if I ask you make up something?" Just free associate. And he said, well, what I'm looking at are some ducks, like, are on my mother's farm in Israel. She raises ducks. And I see all these stupid ducks gathered together. That's my image. I said, well, that's wonderful. Can you can you draw that? And he drew a duck for me on the road. And the place they were hiding was at the duck pond in Palo Alto. Wow. Oh, that's, good job. That's pretty darn good. And and what what prompted you to say that? Like, how did you know to suggest that, to just imagine it or pretend? Well, I've studied psychology. I'm a physicist, but I've studied psychology in, in college. As it turns out, I, I can't... I've been unsuccessful learning another language for certain reasons. I, I can't do that. Uh, so I was, I took a second major in college in psychology. So I, I knew a lot about experimental psychology and abnormal psychology and Jungian psychology. So I was not an engineer just dropped in the ESP lab. I actually had been thinking about things like this uh, my whole life. Hmm. So my 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 I mean I knew all about uh, association and free response and this this kind of I I knew a lot about psychology. In fact, when I went to Columbia Graduate School, what I wanted to do is get my degree in physics, but I I wanted to get my degree in psychology, Ph.D. in experimental psychology, but I wanted to take courses in the physics department because I felt that I was prepared to take the psychology qualifying exam on the spot. I had just read a big, fat handbook in experimental psychology So I was totally queued up to be examined in experimental psychology. And they, of course, I mean, mean, here I am, a a 20-year-old, trying to explain to the chairman of the psych department uh, why I don't want to take any of their stupid courses, but I'm prepared to take the qualifying exam. And they politely explained, if you want a degree in psychology, you're going to have to take psychology courses. (laughs) Uh, But that's a long answer to your question is that uh, I was sort of prepared for the job that I had created for myself. Yeah, it sounds like it. And I have to tell you, this is a tangent here, but, you know, I'm in a psychology PhD program right now, and I just, um, I have one year left, and I'm not supposed to take my qualifying exams for 
another year, but I just had that conversation with my chair and I said, you know, I'm ready to take my exams right now and I don't have to study. Like I could just do it for you right now, right here. And he said, no, we're not doing that. You're going to have to wait. So I'm just kind of floored. And I was like, what the heck am I doing here? You know, but it's you like, heard when the story. The, no, I haven't heard this. I mean, I, mean, I heard you, it just you, in you my own life. Gone, you've sort of gone through it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's incredible. But going back to when you're when you're leading someone through a, a session. So what do you do if you you no, know so that there's first name, my guy's first name was Yakir Aranov. Yakir Aranov. Very probably going to win a Nobel Prize in physics shortly. Wow, and so he turned out to be a good remote, view, an excellent remote viewer then, without even having to try. Everybody who I sit with turns out to be a pretty good remote viewer. <laughs> Can the, I sit with you? <laughs> the, 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 the secret here that is not really known, and that is, in our, we got a lot of money for doing ESP research. You got like a million dollars a year, two million dollars a year. And most of the people who gave us money uh, wanted to see something psychic. And uh, what, I, what I would deal with them is I would say, I have an interesting object in my briefcase here. I sort of knew that this was going to happen. But I'm not going to do a demonstration for you, because if I show you something psychic, you'll then figure, decide that it was a trick and you'll spend your time trying to figure out how I did the trick. Because people understand that I have a background in magic, and I could probably fool them. So uh, I said, I will lead you through remote viewing. Here, here's a piece of paper, and I want you to draw a picture of the object I've brought to you. This is going to be very easy to do, blah, blah, blah. And I would then lead this... Uh, under Secretary of Defense or as General or whoever I was talking to, I would lead them into remote viewing and they would then draw my object. Mm. And I had very, very good success with that. I have a couple of favorite objects. I don't always bring the same one because I don't want the word to get out. But I have... Uh, like three favorite objects that I that I would bring with me. All of them were various kind, shiny. All of them were shiny metal in different shapes. And and so you you mentioned that I mean you personally got these great effects with these with these people. And do you think that there's something about you as you, could, you know? You could uh, you could even ask uh, Ivy. A surviving witness, you could ask Jessica, because I did this with her in a quite noisy cafe. She said, you know, I've never actually taken part in a remote viewing experiment. I've never done it myself. And I said, well, you're, this is the right moment, Jessica. Here, here's a napkin. I've got an object for you. And I would lead her into a remote viewing. And she made a terrific dis good description uh, of an object which I just then put in her hand, and and that's Jessica Utz, right? Who, me. That's Jessica Utz you're referring yep. to. Yes, and um, I think now she's the president of the the American Statistical Association. Yes. Um, yeah. So I, I love that. So, she, that so she's a living, trustworthy person. Yes. So, so then, let's well, this say isn't, this isn't hard to do. That is, but well, I'm, I'm sort of trying to get people to come out of the psychic closet and admit that they have psychic abilities. That's that's a that's a pitch in my two-hour documentary. Psychic abilities are available. You can do this, and we've done <laughs> it with all kinds of people. Not well, hard to do. What so you you know uh, Hella turned out to be excellent. Pat Price did. Ingo Swan did. Um, Joe Joe McMonagall. Uh, do you feel that there's something that sets apart those who 
really excelled? Let's say Pat Price. What set him a- apart from some other people who would would do this or try well, to do the, it? The whole content. The, the, my opinion is that ESP is like a musical ability, and some people sit down at the piano. A son of my good friend was was composing regs as a four-year-old. He would just sit at the piano, and music would just come out of him. He'd just play and play and play. And that's the way he came. He became a pianist, of course, and composer. And, now, nobody, I... had, and nobody had to teach him a thing. He just heard the music. There was a piano in the house, and he sat down and played. So he, he would be at one end. Uh, I had a very nice piano in the house with me for a while. I was piano sitting, and I tried very hard. To, uh, I took piano lessons unsuccessfully as a little child, and I really wanted to learn to play piano. I spent a half a year unsuccessfully because I simply couldn't remember music. I can recognize a lot of music. I have a pretty very good memory for uh, w- w- what's that tune in classical music. But if I wanted to learn to play something and I made a mistake, I'd have to go back to the beginning, and all I could, all I had was muscle memory. And I, the, the disadvantage is my vis- vision is very poor, so I can't actually read music. So I had to memorize it. So I'm at the other end of the criterion in the, uh, of the scale. So even though I wanted to play the piano, it wasn't going to happen. In between are most people. In the 1930s, every well-brought-up woman knew how to play the piano. So when the family gathered around the piano, she would play and they would sing. Hmm. So somehow playing the Playing songs on a piano is something that essentially everybody can do, unless you've got some tragic flaw that prevents you doing that. Right. And I think that psychic abilities are that way. I think that everybody, to a greater or lesser degree, if you set the stage for them, they can be pretty psychic. I think that there are people out in the tail distribution like Ingo and Joe McMonagall and Pat Price. Now, Hella is quite interesting in that, my, beginning of my story, I was talking about Hella brought into the control. And we had done a series of remote viewing experiments designed by Ingo, the psychic hide and go seek, where somebody goes out in the Bay Area to one of 60 possible targets, and then the stay-at-home psychic has to describe what that looks like, and you know all about that. Uh, And doing that, Pat Price got seven out of the nine matched in first place. That is, if Hal had been kidnapped seven, if Hal had been kidnapped nine days in a row, Pat would have found him the first place he looked in seven out of those nine cases. And that was significant at odds of better than one in 100,000 in nine trials. So that's an amazing amazing efficiency of psychic functioning to do an experiment where you have a total of nine trials and it's significant at 10 to the minus five. That's really very hot stuff. Yeah, that's... That's pretty impressive. Hella was and significant at one in a million. So Hella was a thousand t- Hella was ten times more significant than the most psychic man in the world. And, and that's pretty stunning, considering she was your control to start off with. That's right. And I mean, I mean that makes that, that's one of the you, you said that you had some questions about. Uh, the phenomenology of psychic functioning, and I said, well, we have a lot of data, but we don't really understand much. Now, Price could certainly draw much more detailed drawings of something that we wanted to find. 
I mean, he was a high-quality analytic psychic. You give him coordinates, for example, and he could draw uh, essentially mechanical drawing pictures of what was there. Hella couldn't really do that. But Hella could draw well enough so that you could match up her nine drawings with the nine places. It so, turned out that uh, she got five first place matches and four second place matches, and it wasn't her fault. That is, on another day with other judges, she would have got them all right. What happened is four of the targets comprised uh, two pairs of very similar targets. For example, her famous pedestrian overpass, which you've probably seen. Yes, yes in your was, film. That was ranked second place. We don't tell people that. It was ranked second place because what the other target in that pool was a set of railroad tracks with a over a railroad bridge. So it was oh, no. tracked with, so it was tracked with an overhead um catamaran support. So the the judge said, What am I supposed to do? And he, he guessed wrong. And the other pair of targets were two one was a plaza in City Hall and the other was a plaza at SRI and the judge couldn't get the right one. So basically and so in Rank order judging, uh, first and second place, are very close to one another. So Hella came out at one in a million, whereas the two that Price missed were way down at the bottom, and those were real misses. Yeah, and that's that's a good point, because with in, in that case, I would have almost just called to disqualify, you know, having it set up and... and the design that if it's determined that both photos are so close, I mean, I, I could see maybe that would be, you know, challenging to, to do, but that that would really well, wasn't fair was to done, anybody. The whole thing was done double blind with no replacement. So mm -hmm. some, uh, some other person prepared our 60 targets, and obviously you can't have them in a in another universe, you could have had. I was going to say you could have separated them out so you didn't have the railroad target with the overpass target. But if the psychic knew that, she'd say, "Well, then then it becomes a kind of forced choice." She said, "Well, I, I've had a railroad target, so it couldn't be a railroad. Uh, I've had my railroad, and I've had my church." So if 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 she knows that it's done without replacement, then she knows that once you've got a church, you're not going to get another church. Right. And that would require a different kind of judging. Yeah, that that makes sense. So that's so, a, that's a it's a tough one. We don't our silver forecasting failed because of a thing like that. You know, we did we did forecasting for silver futures, where we got nine in a row correct with Keith Harari. Yeah, that that's that's just and then, unheard of. And, and the next the next time we tried to do that, it didn't work, and it was really a failure of the judge, which was me. Uh, because. Harari said, I, I see a zoo with details, and he said, no, that's not it. It's actually a little racetrack where they're racing cars. And in the target pool of four things, there was a zoo and a little racing car thing. So it made it very hard. Today, uh, with a little experience, I'd never, this is the first thing I had to judge. I never did oh, no. any judging, and, and and I guessed wrong. Wow! Yeah, and so that that really shows you how what the judge. An experienced judge, and there was a lot of money. 
because we had done nine in a row, our investor was very enthusiastic. So there was a lot of money riding on the second series. And numerous things were changed, unfortunately. We, we, were, we were in sort of a financial bubble at that time, rather than uh, doing good experiments. Wow. So... Uh, well, and that, we, that really we shouldn't have had the we should not have had the interviewer being the judge because we know that there's problems with that. Yeah, and and this really so many people think that if a trial fails or an experiment fails, I mean I've even heard it said that some people will be well there's there's no evidence of psi, you know, and it's really they're not looking at all the different factors of the judges the target the photo selection, the, 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 there's so many factors that go into this. But w one of the questions I have is, so what do you feel, um, as, as far as if a viewer, let's say you take away the experimental design and you're just using remote viewing for practical application, was there... Well, um, I, had a, I, had a, I had a finished going through the HELA experiment. Oh, so, sorry, you go ahead. HELA, HELA number one. So she said, um, I see motion. There's something moving. And I said, that's very interesting. Can, can you draw anything corresponding to that? And she said, drew some arrows, one following another. And I said, okay, let's take a break. Because we always take a Usually, I do these experiments taking doing three sessions with with two, <coughs> with three breaks and a summary. So she took a break, and then I said, uh, "What what else do you what else is there to see? Is there anything in addition or different that you that comes into your awareness?" And she said, well, it's like uh, water going down to a, down a trough. And she said, but there, this trough has holes in it. And I said, well, that's interesting. Can you make a drawing of that? And she did that. We took a little break for a few minutes. It's the idea you want to, you take a break so you can clean the slate. Mm -hmm. So you come back. And I said, uh... You have a lot to say about this. Do you have any overall feeling for it? Do you have any gestalt of what this place is? And that's when she famously said, well, there's squares within squares within squares. And she drew that, and that turned out to be a very close uh, match to what the place actually looked like. Now, if you, if you hadn't been there with her, Let's say she was just in a room by herself and didn't have you to say, can you sketch that or can you, you know, turn around and look over here. But you just sent her into a room with no help. What do you think would have happened? Would there be a difference in how well be she no performed? Result. And why, why is that? Because, because I handled all the analytical parts of the experiment for her. She just had to lie there and talk into her tape recorder. She had no respons she had no responsibility for any of the mechanics of the experiment except telling me what she's experiencing. And then oh. from time to time I would hand her a clipboard and say, Draw whatever you're seeing and then I would take away the clipboard. So she didn't have to worry about uh, am I getting a good answer? Am I doing what they want? So essentially, you were acting as like one lobe of her brain or one part of her. Exactly. You, and That's exactly what I'm doing. Re remote viewing is a represents the bicameral part of the brain. That is, I'm doing all the analysis to the best of my ability and she does the non-analytic direct experience. If I, if I wasn't there, if I just put her in a room and said, uh, you've got 10 minutes now or 15 minutes now, 
I'd like you to make a description of where Hal is sitting. Uh, there'd be no way for her to actually do that because she wouldn't know what to do. Well, and would you say that's true with most of the people that you were providing that function for them as well? No, Ingo's a professional psychic, so Ingo doesn't need any help. He's been work- Ingo has been working hard all of his life to learn how to do what I've been describing. Uh, Pat Price was a natural psychic, but uh, I sort of set the stage for him also. That I, I kept, I kept asking him, "Do this, do that, take a break, do something else." Uh, I mean, he was a, Price was a functioning psychic. He, he functioned in the world as a psychic person. So I didn't have. He knew. He knows how to turn on the ESP switch. Uh, but in the laboratory, we want thing a little more structured, because uh, I'm sort of the intermediary for the CIA. It's like going to the Delphi Oracle. Uh, you've got the guy who comes in with a question to the Oracle. Then you've got the priest who deals with the oracle, and the priest is the one who talks to the oracle and then tries to make sense out of what she says. The priest is the one who questions the oracle, and that was my job. Wow. Russell Targ, the priest. (laughs) I I like that. Your mother would be so proud. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, that's pretty pretty astounding just the way you're laying it out. So what would you then say to people that are, are they themselves have an interest in remote viewing today? Maybe they, they've, you know, shown some, some promise with their abilities, but they don't really have the benefit of having you act as their priest or the, the left side of their brain. So what, is this where training and perhaps what Ingo discovered, I, I know people don't need to, you know, go through all the training or follow his method, but is is there some value in having a, a having something in writing if you can't have the benefit of Russell Targ sitting there with you day after day? Well, it, it's easier than that. If two people decide to work together, if you can find a, fr- I can't help you find a friend, but if you're able to find a friend, then you have the friend uh, put an object in a bag and come to your house and say, "I've got an object in a bag. Uh, it's a quite interesting object. I know what it is, so I can send it to you by mental telepathy, or you could." visualize what I'm going to show you in a little while, make make a little picture or two of what you think you're going to see in a few minutes. And you can have them do that interspersed with some breaks. And then you open the bag and show them the object, which will probably correspond moderately well to the object. And you do that a couple of times, and then you show up with two bags, and you mix them up on the floor and put one on the table and say, there's something interesting in this bag. I do not know what it is. Because, you see, I don't want to teach you to read my mind. I want to teach you to experience the world. So we've got this bag here with a paper clip on it. I'm going to put it on the floor. So they don't want to teach you to try and look into the bag like Superman. So this is not an exercise of looking into the bag. I want you to look into your awareness of what we're going to show you in a little while, which happens to be the object in the bag. So in this case, I'm not sending it to you by ESP. You can directly see what the target is, which would be direct clairvoyance, or you can look into your immediate future 
and see what am I going to show you in 10 minutes at the end of this experiment. I'm going to put an interesting object in your hand. Uh, so we've got a target identified. Make a little sketch of what you see, remembering that I don't know what this object is. And they'll draw something, and you say, well, that's interesting. Um, could you look at it again and see what it feels like in your hand, for example? Uh, can you tell me about the color or the texture or the material? Uh, turn it over in your hand. Does something new show up? And then you get a succession of what Ingo calls uh, aesthetic impact of how the object actually interacts with you as you turn it over and look at it. And then and, you show the object to the person. And would you say that that's like really important, the aesthetic impact where the person is really experiencing it as if they were touching it and as if their body was in contact? Like how important? I know Ingo thought that was very important. And after the, someone would have a sense like, the sun is shining in my eyes, or the building's bigger than me. So their their body being there. How how important do you think that sensory experience? It's very is? important as long as they're not guessing. See, you, you you don't want the person to the 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 target that I misjudged. My my psychic said uh, I can smell the animals. Uh, I can see the water on the ground. So he was going on a whole analytical trip to the zoo, which he knew quite well, and could tell me all sorts of uh, incorrect things about what was going on. But these are things that once went on when he was last time he was there. So he gave me a very heartfelt aesthetic description of an incorrect place. Oh, no. So his mind kind of just got locked into that, and then from his memory, and who knows, maybe a part of him was connecting, but it was connecting right. with the zoo. Because he not. was an experienced psychic, he then said, you know, that's not the place. It's really something entirely different, which he then described correctly. But as a inexperienced judge, I said, well, he's got this whole aesthetic impact, and generally, the first thing a psychic sees is the most valuable. So I incorrectly said, I think he's gone to the zoo. And he was then extremely angry with me. He said, I've done all this work, and you still don't trust me. I told you the zoo is not the right answer. How could you choose the zoo? And that was basically the end of our friendship and the end of the solar <laughs> forecasting. Oh no! Well, yeah, remote viewers, <laughs> excuse me, can can get very sensitive about things like that. But you know that brings Especially up an interesting. Especially when there's a lot of money involved. Oh no! How much did you lose over that one? Well, I didn't, but the other person lost in six figures. Ooh. Ouch! Yeah. Uh, ouch. <laughs> I can oh only... my god. I can only imagine. But do you think, like, I just had this experience because I was serving as an interviewer or monitor for a student, which I, I tend to just be my own remote viewer and, and not really monitor people too much. But the, she was she was having an analytic overlay of a circus tent, and, and I said I knew it wasn't going to be a circus, but because of what she was describing, I was thinking – that it was most likely a building. And because, and I realized at that point in my mind, I got it solidified as the interviewer that she must be describing a building. And then she went into this whole description of a building. And it turned out then that that was totally wrong. The target was of a crater lake, like flying, it was a photo of flying over a crater lake. So was it possible that me, I got the wrong idea in my mind, similar to what you're saying, and then perhaps telepathically she went to where I was going, to a, to a building that wasn't even there? So it, did you find that well, happen with other... That's a multi-part question. For, first of all, Crater Lake is like being in a building. 
if you've ever been to Crater Lake. Crater Lake is a small lake surrounded on all sides by 2,000-foot-high mountains. Hmm. So it's not unlike being in a tent, for example. Interesting. I've never been there, so I didn't know that. And the the photo was uh, aerial, you know, from up high, so you just see more of a round circle. So that could have been part of the problem because she was actually trying to send herself to the location. Very, very interesting. Now, um, I will often have the experience of going to the place with the person um so if they have a problem I can try and help them. For example, the CIA once targeted Hella and me. Can you this is a demonstration ability task. Can you tell us what Brezhnev's office looks like in the Kremlin? Okay. So so we know we're not in a cornfield. <laughs> and and we we're, and we're we're in a building. Can you describe that? So Helen, so Helen and I are in our little workroom, and she said, "Well, I'm walking down a hall, and everything is red color. And at the end of this hall, there's a door with an arch over it, and the door is covered with red leather, held in place by brass or postage tacks." So I'm already salivating because I know that that's a strong, identifiable, unique object. And I said, can you go into the room? And I have the idea she'll just drift in. And she said, no, the door is closed. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll open the door. And she said, well, the room, it's dark in the room. There are eight hours ahead of us. So I said, okay, I'll turn on the lights. And we can look around and see what's there. And she said, well, on the right-hand side, there's a really big desk covered with glass. And on the left side, I think I'm looking out on Red Square. And by the way, behind the desk, there's a, a door in the wall, in the wood-paneled wall. And I said, okay, why don't we open the door and see what's there. And she said, well, there's a flight of stairs going down. So I said, well, what do you see as you walk on the stairs? And she said, I see a computer bay, lots and lots of computers. And at that point, I began to get frightened from being, I, I felt vulnerable being in, in the depths of the Kremlin, like who knows what kind of psychic countermeasures you're going to find. <laughs> Wow. So I said, I think we got enough. Let, let's get out of here. And two years later, I was lecturing at the Kremlin, and they said, do you want to see anything? And I said, I'd like to visit Brezhnev's office, and everything she saw was correct. But wow. that was basically done. The, the, the red door with the upholstery tacks, the windows on the left, the desk on the right, so forth. We did not go, I did not ask what's behind the door. <laughs> well, that's that's just incredible that they let you into the office and that you actually got that confirmation. And and do you think that she did so well because you would in the future end up getting that confirmation as far as your feedback? Do, do you think there was some connection to that? That's a very interesting question. I never thought of that. Hmm. First question I have to think. Of, yeah, first question I have to think of is she still was she still alive? And the answer to that is yes. She, she hella hella was still alive. So she so did was, get that feedback. I mean, you were able to share it with yeah. her. I and, think so. Let's see. I was there in '84, and she died in 1992. So I must have given her feedback on that. I don't remember giving her feedback. But it's quite likely because I was in touch with her the whole 
see, I went to Russia after the, I couldn't go to Russia during the program because I had top secret clearance. Oh. The program I left the program in eighty two, and I went to Russia in eighty three and eighty four, and this caper. See, my daughter was with me. I think it must have been eighty four. You you really have a astounding memory for these dates and places. I mean, we're talking what 30, 30 years ago or more. So so um, I know we're almost. Well, you see, at all a time. these things are really etched in my memory because I'm doing magic. So it's like Bobby Fisher was a great chess player, happened to be my brother-in-law. And he could tell you about every chess game he ever played through his whole life. Wait, he was your brother? Bobby Fisher was your brother-in-law? Yeah. He was married to your sister. I was married to his sister. Wow. That, I never heard that before. What, um, is there anything you could tell us about that? Like, what was he like in person? Well, he gets a bad press. In person, he's humorous, very intelligent, interested in what's going on, amiable, sort of a little self-serving like President Trump, that everything circles around him. Uh, after he won the championship, he stayed with us, uh, but he had gotten into a very anti-Semitic way of thinking, and we eventually kicked him out because we didn't want him talking that way around our little children. But wow. He had, uh, but the, the the reasons why he would be anti-Semitic, which I don't want to go into now, uh, it, 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 it's not, I don't want to put on the tape. Yeah. Well, well, did you ever play chess with him yourself? Um, I once played with him a blindfold game, and he beat me without problems. Swiftly, and I, and I'm assuming he was wearing the blindfold, not yourself. <laughs> we were in a different room. He was eating lunch in a different room, and I was playing with both sides. But that reminded me of another version of chess called Kriegspiel, where uh, each person has a full chess set in front of them but they don't see where the other person moves. So you've got a, a referee. Is, I'll move, and then they'll tell, tell White. They'll then say uh, to the other person that White has moved. And uh, you keep track of your moves, and you try and figure out where the other guy moves. And that's quite a interesting and playable game. And he didn't like that. That Because I would capture his pieces, and he said, where did my bishop go? And they said, well, Russell captured that. He didn't like that too much. (laughs) Wow. Have you, are you familiar with Darren, Darren Brown? He, he does all those um, YouTube videos. He's a mentalist, and his name is Darren Brown. And he, does there's a video where he's playing against like eight or nine uh, uh, chess masters and he beats them all, all all at once and basically he does it by they're all at different tables and he just he memorizes the moves that one makes at one table and then he copies that and makes the same move at the next table and somehow by the end he's beat everyone it's Pretty phenomenal. That's very interesting. He, so he must be a, uh, a chess player in addition to a mentalist. Yeah, he's he, not doing this blindfold, I presume. No, no, he's he's not. He's just um, showing that he can beat several of the best players in the world all at once. 
I'll send you the link. It's, it's pretty cool. I'm sure you'd enjoy it. Well, we don't have a whole lot of time left. So one, I just have one more question, and then Michelle has a few questions for you. And uh, when I watched uh, one well, video... I have something and I, that you should know. So our, yeah. our work at SRI did work, worked very well because we had very talented people, and we, we had some idea, good ideas about how to work with them. So I would say that for naive people, an interviewer is very important to show people the moves. So mm -hmm. after they've learned the moves, then they may not need an interviewer. And, and the other thing to know is that... Um, Um, Ma Marty Rosenblatt is now doing very, very well with his silver forecasting because he now has a couple of people who individually are scoring in the 65 to 70, 75 percent bracket in binary trials. Mm -hmm. So that what he's shown through what must be 15 years of work, is that you can't make any progress unless you have really talented people. He had the idea, very democratic idea, that everybody has psychic ability, and if people want to play, uh, every, he would set up groups with lots and lots of people, and for a period of time they would do very well, and then they'd crash. But if you work with people who actually have ability, like the, like the, the Hal and I chose six people from a big group of Army folks, and uh, they continued. Joe McMonagall was one, and um, I, I, I can't remember right now who the other, but uh, the Army people continued their ability. Are you still with me? Yes, yes. You know, yes, and... Michelle, Michelle, and I, you know, have have done a lot of work with with Marty and, and his organization, and yeah, and we've had some pretty good runs runs too. So, uh, yeah, it's it's exciting to see what. The secret to his success right now is that he's working with very talented people. So, if you've got people who can score sixty to seventy, you can make a lot of money. If you've got ordinary people who are hovering around 50, they will have occasional hot runs, and then they'll crash and you lose all your money. Yeah. So, yep, so we've there's, seen so that. there's no secret as to what targets you should use, how you should do it. If the people are not innately out on the tail of the distribution, uh, it's not going to work. That you can't average noise. And and I just have um yeah I agree with you right there and just a question uh, when I have, I watched a video where you were monitoring or interviewing Hella and I felt that you were going into a trance state yourself like you just see and, and maybe that's what you were talking about before of you know going to the the target location with her, but I was like, Russell looks like he's in a trance. It feel, you know, you get this feeling when someone is in a deeper state. Would you, would you say that you were aware of that? That you're, uh, you were in a trance state would of be a little. I, I'm on this side of a trance, but uh, I was. I would drift in and out of a remote viewing state. See, I'm operating a tape recorder. I'm taking notes. I'm watching the time. So I'm pretty analytical. But I, I would certainly, if... I'm trying to think of, of another one that other than... Um, the pedestrian overpass... I think trying to think of, of another striking one that I may have done with. If she starts to say something that sounds analytical, that I will t I will announce we're taking a break now. 
Mm-hmm. So you you would really help her to get out of the analytic part. Yeah. Um, but I maybe trance is a strong word, but when you say remote viewing state, you know, it's somehow maybe, say, getting into the zone or getting into the flow, but I just felt that I mean, you As I described the, the thing in Brezhnev's office, uh, she said it's dark, and I say I'll turn on the lights. I, I'm pretty much with her on that whole trip. Yeah. I mean, that, that was, there were a lot... In a certain sense, you could say that we were both having an out-of-body experience traveling through the Kremlin together, and when she needed the lights turned on or the door open, I would do that for her. You really had to be intimately with her each moment. You couldn't be like, you know, sitting there while she's doing it and thinking about your taxes or No, no, I was... I'm always very... (laughs) close with anybody I'm leading in a remote view. I'm really paying very close attention uh, to what they're doing, even if it's somebody, uh, some army officer across the desk, because I know that uh, I really have to listen to every word he says, even when I don't know what the target is. I've become very skillful at list. I've become skillful at discerning whether what the person is saying sounds like remote viewing. I can give you an example of that. Uh, Jeffrey Mishlev got his Ph.D. in parapsychology, as you know. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, during that period, he was very interested to see what we do at SRI. So we sent uh, Elizabeth Rauscher off to hide someplace. And I was sitting with Jeffrey... And I said, well, Elizabeth should be at her target now. I have no idea where that is, of course. Uh, What comes to view? And Jeffrey said, well, it looks to me like Macy's. So that sentence communicates to me, first of all, he's not doing remote viewing. What he's doing is taking an analytical guess based on a flash that he got. So I rudely said to him, Come on, Jeffrey, don't tell me about Macy's. Let's take a break. Uh, Tell me what you're experiencing that makes you say Macy's. What images do you have that make you say that? And he said, well, I see something like a bunch of coat hangers on a rail, and there are clothes hanging on it, and they're one after the other after the other. And I said, well, that's very interesting. Can you draw that? And he then made an excellent drawing of the pedestrian overpass, which is where uh, Elizabeth was hiding. Wow. But but that required me to know that uh, Macy's is not the answer to a remote viewing trial. And and how did you know that? Like, did did you know that logically, or you just it's it's never the answer. Because I, I need him, I need him to tell him about uh, his experience rather than to name a department store. The naming it. The, so that is, no, 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 no. People think that they can name it. I said, I, I know it. That looks like the uh, SP Depot. That looks like the airport. And indeed, it might look like what you're naming it, but it might be something entirely different. So you got to steer them away um, so if somebody, yeah, if somebody so, said if somebody said, "I think I'm inside a tent uh my experience would say, "Well, I would say to myself, "Well, there are an awful lot of things that sort of look like a tent. I would say, "Let's take a break." Uh, tell me what you're experiencing that makes you say tent. And there's all kinds, of, all kinds of things could come to mind that could say a tent. It could be indoors, outdoors. And so I mean, there there are many tent-like structures in the world that have nothing to do with the tent. Right. So you want to be you want to be very vigilant 
against the person uh, slipping in some analysis, especially early in the interview. So really to sum this all up then, it really is very important what the interviewer is doing. Um, the you know if you're you're pretty much saying that you can't just take like a, a brand new person to remote viewing and not give them a monitor or give them anything. You need to give them at least um, whether a monitor or some instructions of of how to proceed or they're just going to... So you need, you need an experienced monitor to steer them away from analytical overlay. Okay. And that's, yeah, that that's important because sometimes you do hear people say like, oh, well, you know, people don't need, um, you know, I, I'm an advocate for instruction just because uh, a lot of times, again, people don't, you know, have the benefit of a trained monitor. So the idea of instruction would then be, okay, well, you know, what do you do when you get into you, having to learn how to recognize analytic overlay yourself when it's coming up is hard, but that's what that's what Ingo did over time. So, so would you say, would you agree that if you don't have the benefit of a monitor and you can't find a friend that having some guidelines to get yourself out of it when you hit it, you know, if you if you can be diligent about your own inner processes, would you agree that that could be the next best solution? I have the idea that it would be tough to learn remote viewing from a book. Mm -hmm. Do you do you think that if you had a trained monitor, like did you find that over time, maybe in the end, um, how are some others like they may not have needed your guidance as much towards the end? So in that case, some learning did take place of what you were doing, essentially. Like well, at some Joe, point, Joe, for example, was ready to march off. Joe, Joe McMonagall, the unique, outstanding. Person, I don't think he had. Um, yeah, he is a monitor in the army. Did, did uh, he have he, one he for many? He doesn't do it anymore. How, how many years would you say he had a monitor? Um. Well, he had a monitor for six trials with me, and he got five out of those six first in first place matches. So he was independently significant, like one in a thousand in five in six trials, which is really outstanding. Uh, he then went back to Fort Meade, and the protocol was to work. I think he, I'll guess that he worked for another year with a monitor. Because I know uh, Skip Atwater was working as a monitor. Skip studied with Ingo. So Skip knew what remote viewing was. Skip was the uh, the manager of the Port Mead program with mm -hmm. all of those viewers, all of whom I had trained with there, uh, as the monitor. So all of them had an idea what remote viewing sounds like. So it sounds like it, they, it was a combination of your own expertise, what Ingo picked up from you, and then you might have picked up some things from Ingo, and then, and then Skip learned from Ingo, and then he was monitoring Joe, so Joe got the benefit both of what you and Ingo brought to the table, so to speak, until he was ready to just launch on his own and not feel like yeah, he Ingo needed to. Ingo is the one who told us the words about analytical overlay and that analysis is a problem. So, uh, I mean... I I was I I had never heard that before, even though it was in um, Bourcoyer's book, Mind to Mind. He mm -hmm. understood all that in the 40s, 
but I had not read that yet. Uh, but it totally registered for me. One thing I started talking about mental noise, I, I to, totally got that. So I think, like he's like the prepared mind, prepared mind. As soon as Steve Jobs saw the user interface at Park, he did, he couldn't wait to get himself out of there and build that. He just had to see it on the screen to create Apple Computer. He didn't need any for He was a prepared mind. He just uh-huh. soaked that up and said, let me out of here. I know what the future looks like. And Xerox closed down Park, and Apple and Jobs created Apple. Just as soon as he had that vision, and so would you say, what what would be the analogy there then? The analogy or? is you've got to you've got to have your viewer understand the problem of mental noise. Mm-hmm. That, and, that, it, that you're looking for, as soon as you want to name the thing, uh, you're, you're got to take a break. It's not that you're on the wrong track, but well, once uh, you, all, you were asking me a number of times, what if they were by themselves? Well, if Jeffrey was by himself and saw Macy's, he would be stuck. He'd be anchored to Macy's. It, it requires... Yeah requires somebody to say, okay, that's interesting. Let's take a break. What are you experiencing that makes you say Macy's? I mean, it's not rocket science. You just have to pry them off the stuck places. Yeah, and and, um, I love that expression. It's not rocket science coming from a physicist. um... I've done this. Uh, with Art Bell, for example, and George Norrie, where uh, they would have an object, and I'm sitting here at my desk, and I describe their object. And my desk is full of interesting things. I just close my eyes and look for something that's qualitatively different than anything I have in front of me, some new, interesting, three-dimensional object. For example, and, I, I was once sitting at my desk at Lockheed just before I left because I had a very boring task that I'm also not sure. I, I was spreading the numbers for my program on a, a spreadsheet on the computer. It was, first of all, hard for me because I don't see well, but that's what I was doing. And I got a phone call from a woman who said, you gave a very nice talk at my house, wealthy house in Hillsborough. And she said, I said, thank you. I was happy to be there. And she said, but I've lost my tennis bracelet, and my husband will kill me if I can't find it. Can you help me find it? And I said, well, I actually don't know what a tennis bracelet is. Can you tell me what I'm looking for? And she described this circlet of diamonds, platinum ring with diamonds set in it. And I, she said, I had no idea where I could have lost it. So I just turned my chair away from the screen to look at the plain wall in front of me and close my eyes. And I said, I, in your property, is there a place where you've got two four-by-fours painted white about four feet away from each other in the grass? Just, just two posts painted white. She said, well... Yeah, by my back door, there there are two four-by-fours marking a a path out of the house. And I said, take a look. I I, I think it's near there. I just have a flash of this thing, which I wouldn't normally say. I mean, it's a very unusual thing for me to get a picture of these two four-by-fours with pointed tops. It just came to me. And she came back in five minutes and said, oh, thank you so much. She didn't say, how can I thank you, because I could have probably thought of something. But uh, she said, thank you very much. It was right where you said. So so there's like no cool down. I just turned my chair 
close my eyes, take a couple of deep breaths, and look for something interesting to pop into my awareness. Can I ask a question? Have you ever heard of the black pearl? It's like in Zen meditation to like get to the black pearl or something about the blue, that. The blue, blue pearl, maybe. Is it? The, it's something. As yeah, what, I've heard. I've heard, heard yeah, you know, I sat with Muktananda once, and he wanted to know if we see the blue pearl, and that would be important for him. And I had not. I told him I, I've heard of it. It's certainly in Hindu writings, but I had not in. in I had not uh, inc- encountered anything, nor had I read anything. I couldn't. The answer is no. I don't know anything about it. Because I was told that um, it's kind of like somebody, you have to kind of shed every single thing you know to be a good remote viewer. That was a statement that was you told have to, to me. Shed everything that you know or that you think you know to become... Uh, a good remote viewer. I would. I wouldn't say that. No, no, I would not. I wouldn't agree with that. Okay. You have to quiet your mind. You have to. You have, being a meditator is very helpful because it gives you access to the off switch, which many people don't have. I mean, if, if you can't stop the ongoing chatter, you can't do remote viewing. Right. So you, you've got a, a, a signal noise problem. It's really noise management. So right. You've got to get rid of the environmental noise. You've got to get rid of your analysis. And, you know, Michelle had a great question. But giving up everything. In remote viewing. See, we, we talked to a, a famous, terrible person, Sid Gottlieb, who was at the CIA, who invented or who ran the MK Ultra program. And he thought it would be cool if we could give LSD to our remote viewers. And wow. this is 1972, so it was an amusing idea for me. Uh, but I already knew that remote viewing was a intellectual task, not necessarily analytical, but you needed your functioning in order to separate the signal from the noise. The whole... The whole process of remote viewing is to separate the signal from the noise. Like when you meditate, no matter how good a meditator you are, all kinds of junk is going to pop up into your meditation Mm -hmm. because that's the way it is. Things things come up. And in in remote viewing, you've got to be aware of the things that are going to come up that have nothing to do with the target. So you've got to recognize the signal and recognize the noise and take a break or let go of the... If you get a picture of Macy's department store, which is a big analytical thing, you know that Mm -hmm. that's not the target. Right. Or or it's not yet the target. If if you describe... um, I see a brick building, I see arches, uh, a big piece of glass. This reminds me of Macy's. Well, Macy's might appear at the end of a 10-minute remote viewing because you've, you've sort of described the bits and pieces of Macy's. But if you come in with Macy's, it's most unlikely, like, like never, it is the right answer. So, so what happens at the beginning of the the session is different than what happens at the end. You would look at the data or, or perceptions differently, or at least the uh, the naming of things different. Yeah, if, you, if the guy, if the person comes in naming something, I would assume that he's screwed, <laughs> and unless he starts over. Yeah. Because well, what, once once you have a strong analytical hook into something is very hard to undo that. And I know what I, I I often would tell people uh, before we would start I would say is there anything that you should tell me 
before we start the session. Has anything happened to you that we should debrief uh, before we start the session? And he might say, yeah, I was almost run into by an orange Volkswagen, Jerry McBronico once told me. <laughs> and I said, good, let's let's get rid of that orange Volkswagen and put him right on the top of the paper and call that AOL. So uh, I, I hadn't mentioned that for a long time. I don't think I've ever told anybody that. But we would always... Uh, Deb with the army people, especially, we would always debrief any kind of uh, analytical overlay that you come in with. Well, and and that seems like something that Ingo incorporated into his work, um, where he I I know that he would make that suggestion that people have to declare what it is they just dealt with and anything bothering them or distracting them that. That makes sense. Um, but Michelle, you had a question that we had discussed before Russell joined us. That do you remember that one? Which one? Which one? Well, well, basically, we yeah. were one. We were wondering for you, like you, you've you've done a million interviews. You've answered so many questions. Is there something that you wish people would ask you about, or that you really? Uh, some kind of message that you want to get across about anything, really. What What do you wish? Well, I kind of. I, I mean, I kind of want to. I was thinking. I was thinking about the fact that um, you know, Art Bell passed, and I started thinking myself, like, not that I'm famous or anything or whatever, but I I knew that we were going to be talking to you, and I wanted to kind of ask you um what how you would want to be remembered and um and you know just I know that's kind of a a little bit of a morbid question but I think it's also important you know because it brings out the most important things that you've done in your life that um in that you want to impact like a big huge strong message I'd say that I had insatiable curiosity, like the elephant's child. I, I, I don't take anything for granted. I always have have more questions. Whenever I go to a lecture, I'm the one who has the most questions. <laughs> so yes, I, we've I'm, noticed that. <laughs> we've noticed that <laughs> at the conference. You always ask a question after every talk. And so I'm, always looking, I'm always trying to find out what is the thing that they haven't told us. Right, that's what we want you to do. What haven't you told us? You're having what? What haven't you told us? Well, the thing that interests me most right now is my dreams. Does, well, uh, you're I'm very to the right people. <laughs> I'm interested in precognitive dreams. I mean, precognition is certainly a big part of remote viewing because you can often describe what you're going to see for feedback, and that's often helpful. Or you, or you may have a precognitive target. Which what, what am I going to? I'm not going to see. With the silver forecasting, you don't get to see the thing until afterwards. The ARV is straight up precognition. But uh, in, in that case, so in in my dream life, uh, I, I I remember my dreams pretty well, and I have to learn to separate the anxiety dreams and the wish fulfillment dreams from the uh, dreams that are bizarre or unusually clear. So, for example, uh, I have a lot of anxiety. I still have anxiety dreams about college, where I'm going to be examined. And and my worst dream is is an examination on the blackboard, and they can't see it. I had a I had a replay of that recently. I'm in a movie 
class at Stanford, and they sat us down in one of the little lecture theaters and looked just like my nemesis at Columbia, where I had a teacher who didn't speak English very well and everything was on a blackboard and I couldn't see it. It was a ter- terrible re- re-stimulating of that bad experience. So if I, if I have a, a dream about examinations, I know that that's a anxiety dream. But if I have a dream that is unusual, has bizarre elements, and is unusually clear, then I will tell my wife about that, and you can enter that into the figurative big book, and I get credit mm-hmm. for it if it's correct. All right. Because cause you got to separate. If I told my wife every dream I had and some were correct, well, that wouldn't be very interesting, uh, but the, but I've learned to separate out those that have unusual elements. So two days ago, I had a dream where I was invited to Esalen, where I've been many, many times. And I taught there for 40 years, so I really know Esalen well. And I was invited to join a circle at Esalen in the big house. And I couldn't do that because there was $1,500 admission, and I, I didn't have that money to pay admission. So I thought, so I woke up and I thought, all of that is really quite bizarre and, and realistic. And I told my wife about it. And then by 10:30, I was sitting in front of my big monitor here, and. Um, Mr. Kripal, I can't remember his first name, who's making a film about Esalen, had sent me the film he's made, and it opens with a circle sitting in the big house, including me. Wow. And I haven't been to Esalen since um, 2012, so I haven't been to Esalen for six years. And there it is on my screen, and I'm in the circle. So I I actually felt shocked when I saw that picture. It was really uh, a shock of recognition right out of my dream. And you had just had that dream that night, that, right. that morning. That's right. It was, uh, I saw it on the screen like a half hour after I had just related the story to my wife. That is pretty awesome. And did did the fifteen hundred dollar no, that was it. That, that was loop for, that was free floating anxiety. Yeah, but gosh, it, but it, I, that... I have a lot. I have a lot of dreams like that. I would say that uh, these days, uh, once a month, I have a quite high quality precognitive dream about something that's going to happen a few hours after waking up or or in a movie and and do these do they seem to always pertain to your own life or have you had any that pertain to wider society oh well, some of them pertain to just what's in the film mm-hmm. I mean, I had a, before I saw the E.T. film, I had a really clear dream in which I, I, I used to ride a motorcycle all the time, as you may know. So in this dream, I was riding my bike down a hill and across the bridge and up the other side of the hill over running water. And I thought that that was pretty unusual because it had sort of had an unreal the sort of Disney esque quality. So so that that got me to tell my wife about it. And that exact thing turns out to be a famous scene in E. T. which we saw that night. Oh that's wow. That's really cool. Well, and you just brought up one of the great mysteries of the universe, which is how does Russell Targ ride a motorcycle if he's legally blind to that? Very carefully. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm, 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 I'm vigilant. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, just, just you use give your me a call and let me know. Yeah, let me know when you're going to be on the road, and I'll I'll just take the day off. No, I've 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 so I've gotten rid of the motorcycle about ten years ago. So you're like, what kind of motorcycle did you have? I had a Honda 250 Nighthawk. Quite uh, a nice. Did you wear a helmet? Of course. Good. Yes. Okay, good. So I, I gave oh, a, wow, you're a mo- motorcycle dude. <laughs> I give a pretty good impersonation of somebody who can see what they're doing. So <laughs> my my wife was a, aware that I had problems reading because I got my nose in the book. So uh, so it was, it's it's clear that I've got some kind of problem. But it wasn't until we were married for a couple of years that she realized how very bad my vision was. And she said that i got to get rid of the motorcycle. Said, You're 70 years old. Uh, oh, my the, gosh. And the, and the argument is that uh, if I had an accident, uh, I would not recover as fast as a younger person. Yeah, yeah. that's true. So I got rid of my bike 10 years ago. But I rode oh, my wow. motorcycle for 35 years in and around the hills and dales of Silicon Valley. Wow. That's very cool. Can I ask you a personal? I want to ask you, how did you meet your wife? I met my wife in church. Uh, she saw, with a, it's so funny, I'd, go, I'd gone to church because um, Paul Allen, Mark Allen, the owner of um, New World Library, was going to be lecturing on his book. He wrote a book called Visionary Business. And I knew that he had just published Deepak Chopra's um, then latest book and made a million dollars on it. So I knew that he had tons of money. And I had just written a book called Miracles of Mind. And I was having a hard time finding a publisher so I thought Mark Allen might be a good guy to publish this. So I went to it was my church. So I went to church to listen to Paul to Mark Allen. Paul Allen is another person who's the head of uh, Microsoft. So it was Mark Allen, and I went to see Mark Allen to put this book in his hand as he was in the front of my of my church after it was done. And I was there writing down some notes, and my wife Patricia saw me there with a very shiny uh, silver ballpoint pen in this pretty empty church, and she just came over to say hello, because I was uh, was wearing a jacket and slacks, and I was sort of odd this odd person with his nose and his notebook and his shiny pen. So she came, sort of came over to get a better look at who is this apparition with the curly hair in the dark church. And basically said, said, hello, what, are you, is it like, do you come here often? Are you a member of the church? And I said, I am a member, I am a member of the church. And so was she. So I had the advantage of having a pretty girl go with me up to see uh, Mark Allen. I handed him my manuscript, and he published it, and we got married. Aww. Wow. And how how yeah. long ago was that? Fifteen years. Wow. Is that... So I found had... my wife and my publisher in church. <laughs> Who would ever expect that to happen in church? Well, well, that's what I, the Course in Miracles teaches. <laughs> the main teaching of the Course in Miracles is that expect a miracle. Yep. Yeah. And and so I have a question, and, and just let us know if you have to have to go because I I know we're we're over our time. But well, for I mean we have all night. It's just how much energy you have. But can you, um, if you think to like the most stunning. Um, 
um, display of Psy, whether PK or just the most stunning thing you ever saw that still shocks you? Is there that maybe we haven't discussed yet? Um, what would you say that was? Like something that you still can't believe you saw, but you know you saw it. Well, if I was going to name name something, uh, I was once doing a series of remote viewing with Pat Price, and Hal had gone to uh, South America. Costa Rica, and each day at noon, Pat was supposed to describe where Hal was hiding. Whether it's a, and we of course didn't get feedback. Was uh, I see a church, or a marketplace, or a harbor, or a volcano? And on uh, day number five, Pat didn't show up. So I'm in my little shielded room at SRI. It's twelve o'clock. Hal is someplace. Price didn't come. So I said, you know, remote viewing is so easy that why don't I just do it? And I closed my eyes and I saw an airport and I saw this long airport with a building on the left and sand and gravel on the right and ocean at the end of the runway. And that's what I wrote down, sand and gravel on the right, airport building on the left, ocean at the end of the runway. And that was that. And Hal came back, and he had a picture of an airport building and another picture of the ocean. And he said, you basically drew exactly where I was. And we then got a photographer to fly down to this island of San Andreas and take a picture. And the picture I have in front of me is essentially my drawing of that picture. Hmm. So wow, I, and you... the, the picture was taken from the angle that I was looking at it. So I have a picture with the airport running from the lower left to the upper right and the oceans at the end of the runway, and the building is on the left, and sand and gravel are on the right. And I would say that that's my most remarkable contact with remote viewing, because I have absolutely, positively no doubt of its genuineness. Mm. That no nobody was nobody could have fooled me. Uh, no, no possibility of error. Yes, it, it, that's amazing that that's what it comes down to because I'm sure you've you've seen all kinds of amazing feats. I mean, you worked with Ingo and Yuri Geller and and so many others. But in in when it comes down to it, you trust your own experience. That's pretty profound. So if the Hella and I. We're the only people in the whole program at SRI who are not Scientologists. Hmm. And so the issue of perfect trust is a little elusive. Can you say a little more about that? As Probably did. not. It, well, it, and it, the, I mean, Scientologists have a big interest in remote viewing before mm-hmm. us. I mean, Hubbard was interested in remote viewing. Uh, Hal used to work, Hal used to wear his clear bracelet uh, for the first two years of the program because he was, I mean, Hal was an enthusiastic Scientologist. And so was Ingo, and so was Pat Price. And and was it just a coincidence that I mean, did they did they know each other before they came in, or was it just a coincidence that all these people who had an interest had started out in Scientology? Or I'll never they... know that. 
Hmm. Were you were you concerned there was some kind of conspiracy of like an infiltration, or did did you ever feel nervous about them being sci- Scientologists? I was never nervous. Um, so, uh, truthfulness is a kind of dodgy. It's like our president. <laughs> if our president told me something that's hard to believe, um, I, I know he's president. But I might be suspicious. Now, mm-hmm. Scientologists are sort of selling ESP as part of the rewards for joining them. So, the Scientologists were very excited that Ingo and Pat were doing so well. Yeah, and and it's probably hard to say. That's uh, you may know. I've been studying um, Ingo's archives since they're located at the university I'm um, going to right now for my PhD. And so I I go there every week to downstairs to special collections where his archives are. And one question I was very interested in was what was the Scientology link? And and I've I have found correspondence between Ingo and L. Ron Hubbard, and um, but but I haven't been able to really ascertain like did they really get any knowledge about about Psy or was it really more just there was an openness and a promise? Oh that no no no! You, 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 it's a much more serious problem than that. Um, when. Pat Price did a series of experiments for us where he was describing a Soviet weapons factory at Semipalatinsk. You've probably seen the nice crane he drew and other stuff. Yes. Right after that, there was a week after that, the CIA hired Price to leave SRI and come live on a farm adjacent to CIA headquarters in West Virginia. And Price was then living on a farm owned by the Scientology organization. No, no, Wait. no question, no, no doubt about it. And he was somehow president of something called the Princess Coal Company, which was also a Scientology organization. And this is all common knowledge. In the, but wait, in the paper. you. But wait, you said that the CIA invited him to go work for them. So how they? So how is the CIA then connected with the Scientology that they they invited him to work know. for them? But what we do know is that each day after he would do a remote viewing with the CIA with Ken Kress, he would then have a meeting with his Scientology auditor. And he would tell the Scientologists everything in that top secret activity between him and Ken Kress. And and do you and think that's this a fact? That's a, that's a that's a known fact. And do you do you think that the CIA knew he was doing this at the time? I don't I don't know that, but I know that he died six months later. Hmm. And is there anything you could tell us about his death? I mean, I know you, you in one version of your film, I, I I think I remember mention of this, but I know there's been different versions. But it, what do you know about, or what do you think happened to him? I don't know what happened. The CIA had a problem. I know that they were worried about Price. There's pro- the the question the the thing in a nutshell is what do you do when you discover that Superman is a double agent? The, they they knew that Price could quiet his mind and read the launch codes from a nuclear weapon. Hmm. 
and, and that made and, them nervous. Yeah. And he, of course. Uh, had he done that, or or you're saying that you knew that he could? We had potential done, to do that. He had potential. Yeah, and I, can, was there, I can see how that would totally scare them. And and so as anyway, far, when you ask me, uh, what do I believe? The, uh, the, uh, there's another thing that I believe. I believe that we forecast nine silver trades in a row, uh, where, where each of them was a one in four trial. Wow. And 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 I'm confident that there was no slip up in that experiment because the the only people involved in that was me at one end interviewing Keith Harari and my broker at the other end who had took complete control of the targets and he wasn't known <clears throat> by the viewer. And, and he, was, he was up in Marin and not known. Uh, I didn't, I, and I didn't even know him. It was done through an intermediary. So I was separated from the target and from the viewer and from the guy choosing the targets. So they totally were a double blind, triple blind experiment so that nobody knew anybody. So I have complete confidence in the silver experiment. And, and that was just stunning, right? That was, I mean, it, it was. It still is pretty. Well, it shows that the future can be known. Because I would sit with Keith and he would describe the funny object that I'm going to show him at the end of the week, and then the week would come and I would show him the object. That's as close to magic as I've ever seen. And what would you say as far as your experience with, with Yuri Geller? Were you pretty. Did you walk away pretty convinced that he was um, really um, doing his PK? I think I remember reading in Mind Reach. Um, was that where you gave the example of he seemed to be able to to do some kind of apportation or something out of thin air? No, no, that, I would not. I would not testify to that. Hell, oh. believe that. I was not convinced. I am convinced that he had telepathic ability, um, some kind of clairvoyant ability. Mm. Because, again, in the film we show uh, that I've just come from the safe, which neither Hal nor I could open. We didn't know the targets. So I had an envelope. I had a double-sealed SRI envelope with a picture in it. And Uri was able to make quite a good copy of that picture before it left my inside jacket pocket. Hmm. So I think that he definitely had some clairvoyant ability. I have to, uh, do you believe in um, UFOs or aliens or that have come to visit us? Do you think uh, I, I have I have no experience with, with UFOs. I, I believe in survival. I think the evidence that some aspect of human personality survives is true is correct. But I, I don't know anything about UFOs. I've just seen uh, Stephen Greer's film Unacknowledged, mm -hmm. the two-hour film on UFOs. And I know that he's devoted his life to it, but uh, UFOs are much more elusive than ESP because <laughs> there's always a trickster element in the UFOs. You can never mm. say, I'm absolutely certain that this is true because I was there and I did it. Right. See, that, that's, see that's why I... That is, when I, when I tell you that I, I drew a picture of some place where hell was, uh, there's no doubt that that happened. No, no, nobody could, nobody could trick me. Right, right. Yeah. 
because they they talk because you were talking about uh, telepathy or telepathic, um, and I'm thinking because I know they talk about these transdimensional beings that can kind of drift in and drift out, and also talk in your mind and stuff. I guess it's true you can't for sure know if it's your imagination or. or I, I have no that. experience with that. Yeah. Okay. Just wondering. Like Alice in Wonderland, I can only believe one impossible thing at a time. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. And and if anyone wants to see your film, what's happening with it? Is it has it is it completely done now or Yes, it's completely done. We... And we're looking for distribution. Oh awesome. Have you had any? The film is in the can. It's in the can. (laughs) Man. Very exciting. Well, we saw... We worked on that for five years. Yeah. Yeah. A long time. I I know (laughs) Michelle and I have both seen different versions of it, and um, it'll be exciting to see what the final version turned out to be. Yeah. Well, and how many hours of footage would you say you had? <laughs> it must have been hundreds of hours, perhaps. Well, we had 50 hours of interviews. The film so you... is two hours. No, we didn't have hundreds of hours. The, the film runs two hours. Um, we had 50 hours of interviews. Have you considered trying to turn it into some kind of mini series? Yes. Or because that it, would be fantastic. It, has a it could be turned into a lot of different things, and and we're thinking about that. Yeah, fifty hours. Well, Michelle, do you have Did any? Did you see the film, uh, the the Netflix film, uh, Wormwood? Wormwood. <laughs> Wormwood is a very gripping. Oh, Wormwood! I saw it. Is it good? Yeah, it's excellent. The six-part mystery surrounding a CIA scientist who was given LSD and then died mysteriously. Yeah. As, and as it happens, I know a lot of people in that film. Um. And the, the the whole film is very well made, and I can recommend it to you because it's so interesting. Oh, great! We'll have to see that soon. And and can you tell us anything and about is, uh, about the people in in that? Is it? Do you think it's a true story? Do, do you have any insider? Well, it is. A, it is a true story. Uh, the story that is the it was believed for many years. Uh, that they gave LSD to one of their scientists, and he jumped out of the window. Mm. And many people didn't believe that for certain reasons. And after a lot of investigation, it was found that that's the an incorrect answer. I'm not going to tell you the correct answer because you want to see the film. But but you would would you say you have insider information so you could no, say that? No, I have no insider. I have no insider information. They they reveal every, they reveal every they reveal more than I know in the film. Okay, we'll definitely have to but see more. It's a very more. very well made, gripping film, and uh, see it with the. Uh, Fast forward in your hand because you want to skip the commercials. A lot of commercials. Maybe maybe Netflix doesn't have commercials. Maybe I would just skip from one. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, a, it's six half-hour episodes. Okay. And my wife and I saw it one evening in a three-hour binge, which is what I recommend. Yeah. Oh, exciting! I, I can't wait to see it. And, yeah. Uh, and also your film as well. Well, gosh, this has just been absolutely if, fantastic. If this gets on the air, I would like you uh, never to play anything that I had to say about Scientology. Okay. 
No, we could we could respect that. And I mean, you really didn't say anything too bad there, but but understand. Well, I experienced uh, yeah. I experienced a lack of trust. Yeah. And that could that could make a big problem for me. Yeah. No, that no problem. We we could totally like we'll make sure that we and, that they, out. Like they might come and kill me. So, <laughs> so that, no. would, that would be a bad outcome. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say bad outcome. So yeah, no no problem. We can cut that out. For sure, yeah. Yeah, and do you still, are you in hell still friends, or do you have any contact these days? I know you went your separate ways. We have a little ways. contact. He was very helpful in making the film. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Michelle, do you have any final questions? I could do the The CIA liked Hal a lot better than they liked me. And we reveal a little of that in the film, because uh, the CIA was worried that I was too enthusiastic, and they thought that was a bad thing. Oh no! <laughs> just, okay. just too, too too enthusiastic in general, or too enthusiastic about, about what you're studying. They thought yeah. I was a believer. Oh no, not a believer. <laughs> and of course, wow. you got to be a believer to make it work. You can't yeah. be an interview. You can't be an interviewer. You can't do ten years of SRO, of remote viewing interviews if you're not a believer. They wouldn't be able to do that. Well, and and in the end, it may turn out that you're one of the most talented psychic subjects of them all. From from your descriptors and your dreams, is your so your wife is keeping track of your precognitive dreams now? It sounds no, like nobody, nobody's keeping nope. track. Oh no, that would that would be good to keep track. I know that's work. And did did you know that Michelle and I with with uh, Dale Graff, we just fin- recently finished up a year long ARV dream. Study where we used our dreams for ARV and Dale, oh, nice. yeah, and Dale was one of the dreamers, and and we're just we're done with it. We're um, writing the it's been written up, so we'll be um, submitting that somewhere pretty soon. And and um, we we ended up not having quite enough trials to be able to determine statistical significance and we were only wagering a hundred dollars at a time but we did we did um end up yielding I think it was five or six hundred dollars. So well, good and for I you. Think, yeah, so we we definitely had some success and it was so fun. Well Michelle had some great dreams and I, I had a couple da- Dale Graph. I mean, he's you know just the ma- master at dreaming photos he'll see in the future, and he's actually a pretty good artist. So he had some really nice, nice. My next hits. venture, my next venture now is an, my new obsession, besides remote viewing, um, <laughs> is his dream share, like uh, to set an intention to to share a dream with somebody. Which, of course, W and I, by accident, had that happen. Where, yeah. Um, twins, a lot of data about twin sharing dreams. Yeah. Yeah, I um, had... Larry had, Dossie can tell you about that. Oh, great. I, I think he's going to be... He might be coming to an upcoming conference. Because Larry's a twin and had... Ex- uh, experiment, experiences like that with his brother. Yeah, that's how I, I have a twin sister, too. That's how I got interested in all this stuff because we definitely had dreams like that. And um, but Michelle, tell tell us about your dream with me in it. Yeah, it was really weird. I had a dream that I saw Deborah across like a courtyard, sitting at a table having coffee and um, and then we were talking about our dreams the next day and she said oh I had a dream that I was sitting at a table drinking coffee or having a drink with uh, John Knowles. That's very, very interesting. 
But, but yeah. what about say if that? you want to if you want to dream about things you're going to see the next day, start with movies. Oh, great. because that's, that's what they they found at Maimonides that uh, movies are better than pictures. Yeah, that, that's a good a great idea. And Michelle, you also had that dream as part of our dream study. Where didn't you say that you were dreaming about doing a remote viewing session? And then I walked up and I pointed to an aspect. I, I think it was like the railings yeah. in the dream. Right, right. And uh, the ship. Oh no, it was it was at a cruise ship or something. There, there was a part that had railings on it, and I told you yeah. that like sketch that. I told you what to sketch in the dream, and then it turned out that what I told you, that was the matching element that matched the picture and helped us get a hit for that trial. So I thought that was pretty cool. That's interesting. I have an interesting remote viewing object that you could describe right now. I have some, some... Really? Something, something that's describable, interesting okay. object. Okay, let's try it. Do you, are, do you have it with you right now? Yes. Okay. What are we, wait, Michelle, what are, we are you ready? We're, we're going to we tune doing? in. You and me are going to tune into whatever object Russell has right now. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. Oh my gosh. It might need a minute. A little tough Hang on. anxiety. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so I, I'm getting something that's like narrow on one side and wider on the other, and something that's wrapped around. Uh, repeatedly wrapped around. I think I'm getting something that's kind of like a, it may be a pale yellow color, like not bright, but a pale yellow or beige. That's that's the color. Ooh. Let me try to tune into a little more. And it seems, is it, can you kind of pull it apart? Like, it seems like it may be um, where I'm seeing like a hand motion of kind of stretching something out, something kind of stretchy. Yes. This this target is kind of stretchy. Like a spring? Like a spring? Like, well, it was kind of hanging it would kind of hang down a bit, or it it, does, it seems like you could. Uh, I don't know if you, like two okay, hands. you're would... seeing the target. Why don't you draw what you're seeing? Because you're describing the target. There's a kind of stretchy, stretchy beige object that hangs down. Okay, draw. let me see if I can get a shape because I'm not. I'm not getting well. Just you draw know, what you said. You got okay. a, a stretchy beige object that kind of hangs down. Okay. That, that's it. Let me see if I get anything else. Does it make some kind of sound? I, I kind of get a sound. Yes, um, it does. It does make a sound. Hmm. And there may be even is it possible? There's two oh, of them. You know what it is. Why don't you just tell me? You know, I don't. <laughs> I'm not really sure. I did just get like an oval shape, but um, what is it? <laughs> just say it. Is, it. is there something that you, is there a reason you'd put it up to your face or like blow, like something with your mouth? Um, yeah. Yeah. Gum. But you know what? Well, gum. I mean, you know, I I don't know. I'm just seeing the impressions. I, okay, let me just say what. Okay, let me let me see a clue that will really help. Let me just do that. What? Why don't you just visualize 
Okay, let me visualize it because I'm... You know, I, I'm getting the... T- if I was going to sketch it, um, it wouldn't be perfect, but it might almost kind of... It almost kind of reminds me of like a heart shape or like where it would it it would be kind of um roundish uh, like two parts um you know a heart shape like where it's kind of um roundish on the top a yeah, couple well, of what I'm ovals. looking at right now is kind of heart shaped okay and then at the like Funny. tapered at the bottom yeah it's hard since i um is there anything to keep going or um is it like a coil or a cone shape or something like that? The uh, I I have to. It seems uh, like you could. It's some kind of pliable and like. Are you holding it in your hand right now? Yes. Yeah, I'm getting the sense of like I'm seeing your hand with it. Is there anything? Is it? Is it? Wait, easy? could there be? Could there be like a a piece of metal on it? Um, yes. Like a little I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to go because my object wants to go outside. Your dog. <laughs> your cat. <laughs> your cat. Large, large, fly, large tan oh, Siamese cat. Oh, that's so cute! Oh my god, I love it. Hey, hold on, please. Okay. <laughs> I didn't see a cat though. I mean, I wasn't really no. seeing it. No, not at all. <laughs> well, that's so funny because we were talking yeah, Zena, about... Zena's uh, 20-pound Siamese cat, mainly tan, and he's been with me this whole time. He decided uh-huh. enough of that. I want to get out of here. <laughs> that's funny. We were talking about your cat before we got on the phone with you, too. Yeah. Yeah, 20 yeah. pounds. 20 pounds. That's a huge cat. That's a big baby. Yeah. So you, you, you I'd mentioned. Like to, go ahead. You, you mentioned that you had done a, a, a object test like this with Art Bell and George Nori. How did they do? Uh, I was viewing for them. Oh, you were viewing for them. And how did you do for them? I did just fine. <laughs> That's time. good. That's a relief. So I, was reading, I was reading an article in the Times this morning about uh, a woman in England who rescued a little dog and because the dog needed rescuing, and the dog just was not well behaved. It was the only really misbehaving dog in all of Germany, and she said whenever she would take it out, people would say nasty things about the dog. But her husband be, was ill, and then the dog was a wonderful healer. Would just sit with him and was friendly and uh, totally attentive to her husband through this whole long illness. And I read that story, and Zena came and found me and sort of crawled up on my chest and wanted to rub noses. And I thought that was such an appropriate th- thing for him to do. After I just read this article about an affectionate animal, that is so sweet. That it sounds like Zena might be intuitive. Yeah, herself. Zena's very intuitive. I, I have a number of stories like like that where he does just, just the right thing, appropriate to what I've been doing. Very cool. Yeah, I had a different name for him when we first. Got him, except I realized he was then uh, much more until I'd given him. A, I don't remember what it was, it was like Serena or some other peaceful, some peaceful name. And eventually, we got him home, and I realized that he's much too intelligent for that. So I should name <laughs> Zeno after a very smart Greek philosopher. Yes, I love it. A cat named after. It'd be, it'd be insulting to call him Fluffy. <laughs> so that's too funny. Well, I was telling Michelle about how uh, when the first time I met you was at one of Marty Rosenblatt's 
ARV workshops for the weekend, and and you had asked me to help you sketch your cat uh, or sketch a cat because the target, if I remember correctly, was of a cat. And for some reason, you asked if I could help sketch it, and then we found out the target was of a cat. Is it Debra, and then I got, is it Debra that I'm yeah. talking to? Yes. This is Debra. I thought, you were in Debra a workshop, I thought you were in a workshop of mine at the uh, Omega Center. No, no, it was actually, it was with Marty. It was the the very first workshop I had ever gone to of his. And there were, I remember it was you and there were nine guys and myself, which I was shocked that, you know, usually you go to something psychic related and it's all women. But then I was like, wow, remote viewing is... Yeah, I remember asking you to draw something, but I, I had a yeah. false memory that, that you were in a... In a I guess I, what I knew that you were in a class with me, but it wasn't my class. Yeah, it was it was Marty's workshop, and you asked me to draw a cat. And here was the thing: so the the target turned out to be a cat. And then my husband called and said, at that moment, uh, about seven or eight cats, black cats, had run into our house and were running all over the house. And he tried to, he caught some of them, but then they were feral. And so I got this phone call that cats were running all over my house right after you had asked me to sketch a cat for you. That was the remote, turned out to be the remote viewing target. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. What are the chances of that? Just very that's bizarre. So part, of, part of living in a psychic bubble. Part of living in a psychic bubble. <laughs> Yeah, you just yeah. gotta you gotta accept it. You gotta live with it. It is. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah. enjoy it. Enjoy it. I'm. I feel very. I've had a fortunate life, so I'm. Uh, very happy to be part of this. Yeah, it's you know it's it's things like that where it just defies such explanation of, of just how these things can come about, and and that's where. The miracle of life really, really hits you. It is, it, this life is pretty awesome. And it's a miracle sure. that we do not yet understand. Yeah, and I guess yeah. I go back and like forth thinking like, do we need to understand it? You know, would that take away the specialness of it no, if we, we have, did? No, we have to. Well, we as soon as you understand, understand it, it, then there's... Because so you there's understand more. there's going to be something new to understand. Yeah, there's more after that. So, yeah. It's, it's the infinite. idea that your awareness is limitless. I wrote a book called Limitless Mind. It's a good title. That is, that is uh, a good title. Is it, uh, your, your, your awareness is spacious. Is, is spacious. And the, the, the whole Dzogchen teaching in Buddhism is about your spacious nature. Russ, what was the attitude of, when you grew up, your family, your parents, what was their attitude towards this stuff? I mean, what made you become, like, what made you be you, you know, from your basic, from your childhood? I was always interested, I was interested in magic. And cards. I played cards since I was an early, early time, and I usually had very good card sense about what to do. And uh, I got involved with professional magicians when I moved to New York, because you could meet and talk with magicians at professional magic stores. And I and I did that as a young teenager, and then I used to do magic shows. And How did your parents feel about it? Uh, they were very supportive. That. My father, my father was interested in science fiction, mm. and he he was a book publisher and used to bring me books about magic. Um, okay, and then and he and took, your he mom? took me to see he took me to see Blackstone when I was a young kid. Oh, great magician. Wow. Oh wow. And what about your mom? See, I made the transition in high school. Okay. 
See, I was about 14, and Robert Rosenthal, <clears throat> who was a classmate of mine, a year ahead of me, came into my biology class with a deck of ESP cards and had us just guessing Zener cards in a classroom experiment. And that made me totally give up magic and get interested in the real thing. Oh. So by the time I was out of high school, I wasn't doing uh, magic anymore. I was reading ESP journals. And would you say that that your earlier experience with magic, would you say that helped you as a researcher, or would you oh, say... Oh, definitely. De definitely. First of all, it made me resistant to being fooled by tricky people and, and be aware of them, make me vigilant of, of not being deceived because it made me understand how easy it is to fool people. That I, I was a pretty good magician, and mm -hmm. it, it's shocking how easy it is to fool people. Yeah. Well, and, but and I, I had experience, you see, standing on the stage, pretending to... Uh, I don't want to... Lie pretending to read somebody's mind, let's say, but I had already read the card they put in the fishbowl, so I would know what their question was. However, I would sometimes have the experience of knowing stuff about the person beyond what was in the fishbowl. So I was aware, as like a teenage magician, that I was getting to supplement my tricks with whatever ESP came my way. That that really answers a question I've had of so many magicians and mentalists for so long is is there an aspect of psi and how how aware of it are they? Well, if you're a professional magician, you wouldn't base your act on any ESP because it's too unreliable. Mm -hmm. But certainly if you get a flash, you can supplement your act with a little ESP. <laughs> and do you think that happens a lot? Yes, I mean, I you're, in a, you're in a side receptive mood. I mean, you're standing on the stage with your eyes closed, and what you're actually doing is trying to remember what was on the piece of paper that you read. But you're then open to whatever other information comes your way. Yeah, so you're in the perfect state for something to happen. And ha have you talked to other mu um, other magicians who... Yeah, I've talked to Melbourne Christopher this? and to the great Kreskin. And they both said, I still get a Christmas card from Kreskin every year. And uh -huh. he's, a, he's a fan because we both talked about how every magician knows that uh, basically that's his where you can supplement your act whenever ESP comes your way. That is way too cool. So well, I, I, have to, I have to go now. I'm going to lose my voice. <laughs> I'm very happy to chat with you about my favorite subject, nothing I'd rather do. And well, we understand. You good, I wish you good luck work with I wish you good luck with your dissertation. Oh, thank you so much. And um, this this has just been so wonderful. It was very, very helpful and insightful to hear everything you had to say. And it was just fun. It was what, what a great way to spend a Sunday evening here. Where are you? Yeah. Where, where are I'm, you physically? I'm physically in Georgia right now. Um, since I'm I'm going to school you here. You me a 408 number to call. Yeah, that that's this is from the um, phone system. So just I think it's 408 is my local for, my local exchange. Yeah, but I I have um, I have a house in Southern California still, so we'll we'll be going back there. And then Michelle, Michelle has been yeah. living in 
Chicago for her entire life, and she's about to move to Southern California. So she'll be alone. Oh, well, that'll be nice and warm for you. No more freezing winters. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I can't wait. I grew up I in can't. Chicago. Yeah, I know. Oh, I remember yeah? that. We both oh. did. We, we went to school together. Yeah, Michelle and I went to high school together. In yeah. Chicago? Yes. Yeah. In in the northwest suburbs in in um, Deerfield, in Buffalo Grove. I said I live in the south side. Oh. Angle, when did Anglewood. you? Oh, okay. When when did you leave there? Oh, about seventy five years ago. Oh. Oh, my. <laughs> just, just a few okay. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. Okay. Well. All right. Well, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Have a good Keep up the good work, and I'm very happy to talk with you. Oh, thank we, you. We love you too. Bye-bye. And um, have sweet dreams. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Good night. Bye. Wow. That was that so was cool. I, I can't Targ, believe Russell Targ, ladies and gentlemen, we just talked to Russell Targ. Hello. And he was only going to do an hour interview, and he stayed with us more than twice that long. And, wow, he couldn't be any more enthusiastic about these topics. And here he's been studying them for decades, and he still could stay up for hours, probably all night, uh, if he his his voice was getting a little hoarse there, but he had you so did a great many... job. You did a great job uh, tuning into what he had in his hands. That was so I love how it was like hanging, and so I have this image of his cat hanging. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like um, yeah, it's like beige and hanging, and I'm like, oh, what could that be? Like silly putty? Like, kind of stretchy. It seems stretchy. Stretchy. I like that. Stretchy. And, yeah, it's kind of going in different shapes too. So, uh, but I guess maybe I was seeing the the ears, the shape of the ears, because they were kind of uh, like heart shaped at the top. But yeah, mm-hmm. talk about putting us on the spot. What, what, are, no, what do I have in my hand? So uh, what were we going to yeah. do? I mean, that's the kind of I thing know. we would do to people. So he just I know he, he just got, got us. He got back. it right back to us. I know we deserve yeah. it for sure. But is so. you know, I think I think back to when I read Mind Reach, which was now about twenty years ago, and that was my all-time favorite book, and in many ways still is about remote viewing and it just mm. I was just blown away not just by the whole Stanford Research Institute and military program and but there's so many wonderful stories in that book and I just remember thinking that it was my dream to someday meet Russell and then I remember when I was at a, a International Remote Viewing Association conference it was it was a spring when my fam, one of my cousins was getting married in Florida at Sanibel Island, and, and the whole family had been invited. The, it was all paid for. The, my, my son went with my sister, and instead of being with the family, I decided to go to this conference. And I remember sitting there, and Russell walked up on stage, and here's this tall guy, thick glasses, curly hair, very a uh, physicist, very... Uh, well, you know, similar to how we heard him tonight, but but just looking a little nerdy. I, I hope he's not going to listen to the interview. He was, he was a little bit of a nerd, nerd. But and I'm sitting there in thinking, in a good way, and, in and good yeah, way. just like us, you know, everyone who knows me calls me a nerd, um, including my never my you nice, a nerd. You know what, Dan, Danny calls me a nerd all the time, and. You know, okay, so here's what proves it. So instead of being on this great vacation on the beach, sipping daiquiris, I'm sitting there looking up at Russell Targ on the stage and just having the feeling that there's nothing in the entire universe I'd rather be doing, nowhere in in the whole world I'd rather be than sitting right there uh, getting to uh, listen to the um, the author of Mind Reach talk about remote viewing, and 
So I just, I had that flashback tonight when we were talking to him, just, you know, he's, not, regardless of whatever he did or accomplished in his life, I, I'm just so in awe of, like he said, his own, his enthusiasm for this subject. And how how often do we just get to talk to anybody who's this excited about these topics? You know, it almost doesn't right, matter right. who he is. It was just so great talking to someone who is just as obsessed with these these areas as we are. Yeah, well, what did you what did you feel was like what was there something he said that really shocked you or you just couldn't believe he was saying? No, nothing really shocked me. Uh well, no, actually nothing really shocked me because um a lot of the things are consistent with um they're consistent with um their, you know, what what he's done in interviews. He's done so many and I've heard that, you know. You know, a, a few things stood out for me and one of the big ones which I'm really thrilled because as you know, my interest is so much in understanding the internal psychological processes that someone's going through when they're when they're remote viewing and there there's there's been a lot of debates in the remote viewing community about is training necessary is you know well anyone could just do this and they don't need they don't it's just easy you know and and on the one hand he was expressing yes this is so easy on the other hand he really came out and said several times, well, it was very much about the the monitor or interviewer and and them needing to be trained and knowing what they were doing. And I've suspected this for a long time. I mean, it's not like it was a secret or anything, but, but I really haven't heard it so clearly expressed that, you know, Hella, the, the, I, I loved how he was saying, you know, he, like he was the priest, he was, he was the part of her brain the the logical part of her brain and and much of her success he didn't phrase it like you know he was her success but but this was a team operation and mm-hmm. and he operated as her analytical mind and 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 even with Joe McMonagall you know Joe Joe says well you know he didn't need training or anything and of course I I love Joe I don't want to contradict anything he says I I just think that sometimes people Look, they they don't really carefully assess what is it that led them to be able to be the independent, successful person that they are. And so Joe, as amazing as he is, he had a ton of guidance. He was with Skip Atwater, who had worked with Russell and Targ, and Skip was his monitor at least for a year. I, I've heard uh, that's what Russell said tonight, right? That it was for at least a year. I've heard, yeah. you know, longer. And maybe we can get Joe on our show and have Joe tell us about that because I'd really yeah. like to hear from I him what led great. to his development. So, yeah, let's let's make that a priority it's to get. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and I'm sure, sure he will also be willing to stay on for, you know, however however long he can physically handle that. So, yeah, wow. Well, I am so glad that you suggested that we get together with Russell and that we made this happen now. Mm-hmm. So, good good job. You had some good questions well, you there. Well, you did a great job, too, yeah. Well, you know, okay. I, I really didn't, I didn't want to monopolize the the question asking time and so thanks for giving me that opportunity to grill him in a big way no it's fine that that's kind of how i want it to go well i know i know we're close to our time so we'll say good night this was really fun we'll say good night to our listeners thank you everyone so much and we will look forward to meeting up with you sometime soon Have a good good night, night, everyone. Bye. Bye.